You might not know this, but Airbus first had the idea of the A380 in 1988, a good 17 years before the first prototype rolled out of the Airbus factory. What happened in that little known period of history and what other high density aircraft concepts did Airbus even consider? Let's explore the evolution of the Airbus A380 design and how we got the plane that we know and love today. Welcome to Found and Explained. Well, technically not an aviation channel, if you like planes, airlines and more, then subscribe. Designing the aircraft of the future in the 80s wouldn't be easy. Engineers knew that passenger air traffic was growing at 5% a year and set to double by the year 2000 and triple by 2025. Thus, the plane of the future would favor capacity over speed and be designed to solve the problem of overcapacity airports simultaneously. Airbus, who had recently launched the Airbus A340 program in June 1987, four engines for long haul, needed to bring a bigger plane to the market that complemented the existing line of Airbus aircraft and competed against the Boeing 747 market dominance that Boeing had enjoyed for so long and only recently launched the Dash 400 series of the plane. Not only that, around the same time, Lockheed was working on a very large subsonic transport and McDonnell Douglas its own MD-12, both programs that ran into issues and had their own respective flaws, something that the team at Airbus was keen to avoid. We have two videos on both of these planes that you can watch after this video. The program would be called the Airbus UHCA, or the Ultra High Capacity Airliner, and would be a secret project even from the Airbus CEO. The small team building the proposal worked in the shadows to avoid competition from discovering their plans and to avoid the media fallout from risking the very project itself. On October 1988, the head of the small group of designers, Jean Rodier, reached out to the leadership team for a lunch meeting and presented them the model of what would become the Airbus A380. Remarking later the CEO's reaction, he was clearly surprised. He did not expect anything that big. Going big and bold won the CEO's trust and the green light was given for further development. The team set to work and drew up a list of requirements to get this plane to the market. First, the plane would need to carry at least 500 passengers to fit above the passenger specifications of the Airbus A340 and prevent any cannibalization of Airbus sales. Second, the plane needed to be better and more fuel efficient than the current reigning large aircraft champ, the Boeing 747-400. Airbus was targeting a number of around 15% more fuel efficient. Lastly, this plane needed to be built with then modern technology, production lines and existing Airbus components. If it was cheap, then that would also be a bonus. With so much at stake, Airbus decided to go into a radical new direction and invite its four partner firms to each come up with a separate UHCA design. The four teams would be, and forgive me for mispronunciations, Aerospatial, Deutsch Aerospace, also known as DASA, British Aerospace, and Constructiones Aeronautics, also known as CASA, and they would only have until 1992 to come up with the Airbus future aircraft. Airbus themselves didn't actually believe that one of the teams would put together a completed concept, but rather that they could pick and choose features from each to build the aircraft, thus lowering the risk that they would not be successful within the timeline. The most important part of these designs was the cross-section. The first design came from Gene Rodem himself at Airbus. Called the Horizontal Double Bumble, it used existing Airbus A340 fuselages married into a double bubble design side by side. This cross section would mean that the aircraft could seat 12 passengers across in a 2-2-2 space 
2-2-2 configuration with a wall down the middle. This design would be cheaper and feature A340 wings, tails and other systems that were already used. The design got as far as the wind tunnel before being deemed too inefficient. Next up was a circular cross section that was a giant circle that had a perfect pie diameter. While it was perfectly aerodynamic and structurally efficient to pressurize, it actually had issues with the upper deck space with curved ceilings and not enough room in the cargo hold. The opposite design to the circular one was the clover leaf. It had plenty of space on board and even allowed gigantic amounts of cargo. To build it, the team proposed either a new large circular design or attaching an Airbus A320 airframe on top of an Airbus A340 fuselage. But where it had excellent cargo capacity, it didn't pass wind tunnel tests. There were other problems too. The A380 Vice President for Engineering later said, If you have a narrow body mated on top of a wide body, then it is too restrictive. There is not enough room for growth and the evacuation rules make it uneconomical. The fourth concept was proposed by DASA called the A2000 that was bigger than the Airbus A380 today. It would seat 615 passengers on three decks, with the first class passengers having cabins on the bottom level. A true triple decker aircraft, which you can actually check out here in this video that we've already done. The last design was called the Ovoid, and it put together the circular and the cloverleaf designs and the key learnings of the A2000 from DASA. Ideally, it was the perfect combination of all the designs, sans the double bubble, and would represent the aircraft's cross-section going forward. But the year of 1992 would be a rough one for the aviation industry. The failure of the MD-12 to realize the double-decker market dream and emerging issues at the MD Long Beach factory itself caused Airbus to slow down development and be far more cautious. After all, this program was estimated to cost a staggering 6 billion euros, which was not to be taken lightly. Airbus would work closely with its 10 selected airlines who had each different criteria, such as Lufthansa who wanted one for European travel, Qantas who needed a plane to cross the Pacific, and Singapore for its Singapore to London route. The design team would propose two different UHCA aircraft. The first and smaller design would be 600 to 800 seats, with the upper range 800 all economy seater design for the Japanese market to rival the success that Boeing had had there with the Boeing 747SR. The latter 800 to 1050 design was proposed with a gigantic wing 63% bigger than the current Airbus A340 and would be 260 feet long. At this point, it would be a disservice to not mention the brief but stunning partnership between rivals Boeing and Airbus's partner firm DASA in 1993 to 1995. But it's such a fascinating tale that it needs its own future video. All that you need to know now is that the result of this cross-pollination is the UHCA program was delayed and Airbus used the time to rejig the design and put together a near final concept called the A3XX. Airbus would integrate the design teams at this point and combine the three concepts into one and by 1995 the A3XX was starting to look a lot more like the current A380 that we have today. Airbus couldn't actually build the plane in its current format as a loose structure of independent European companies. They would have to actually restructure into a single entity to balance out costs and to bring this gigantic airframe to the market. During this restructuring, Airbus would put the final touches together on the A3XX, such as adding in 10 abreast seating to the plane to have a 3-4-3 configuration, and to avoid, and I quote, the American prisoner middle seat, found on American planes that had a 2-5-2 seating configuration. Confident and closer to launching the program, 
Airbus started to shop around the three derivatives that it had of the A3XX. They were the A3XX-100, the Dash-100R, and the A3XX-200. The first would carry 555 passengers in three classes to 7,500 nautical miles. The Dash-900 would be flying the same passengers 8,500 nautical miles. And the Dash-200 would trade range for capacity with 656 seats. The final choice of the cross-section then drove many other aspects of the configuration. Relatively speaking, the fuselage is, for example, quite short compared with the dimensions of the wing. This would mean that the wing would be designed for bigger stretches of the A380 in the future, which we have again done a full video on the channel. Around this time, Airbus also worked on the various challenges that such a large plane would incur, such as what engines would be used to power the aircraft, as well as how to navigate such a large plane around airports and taxiways, with even folding wings like the 777X considered. Plus, at one point Airbus even tested removing the vertical stabilizer on the tail and using canard wings on the upper deck instead. What an interesting design choice that could have been, but alas it would have been too unpractical and get in the way of jet bridges. Lufthansa, who had been an airliner partner consultant during this time, asked Airbus for a shortened version of the A3XX, dubbed the A3XX-50, that would carry only 480 passengers to a range of 7,500 nautical miles, using existing engines like those on the then new Boeing 777. At the same time, Airbus would also add in the Dash 100E, or later known as the A380F, cargo version at FedEx's request. Finally, after millions of dollars and years of work, the design was frozen in 1998 and Airbus was ready to launch the new A3XX at the Singapore Air Show. But seemingly right on cue, the Asian market was struck by a financial crisis. Airbus then said because of this that they would delay launching the program until airlines were ready to order. However, this is actually not the real reason. Airbus was struggling with achieving the second criteria that was outlined at the start of this video, that the A3XX had to achieve at least 15-20% to of the fuel efficiency over the 747-400. To try and reach this, Airbus delayed the program again by another 9 months and pushed the wing size from 8,400 square feet to 8,800 square feet adding small winglets like those used on the A320, and also change the composite materials used in the construction, making it more expensive, but also better fuel efficient for airlines. With this goal finally achieved, it was time to actually try and sell the plane before the launch. The plan was to try and secure a wide range of orders of only a few aircraft, but with as many legacy carriers as possible in each of the airline alliances, One World Sky Team and Star Alliance. They reasoned that one or two airlines that had picked up three or four aircraft, the others in the alliance would actually go on to order the plane as well. Airbus was focusing on airlines like British Airways, Air France, Singapore and Qantas, but it was a surprise that the new Middle Eastern carrier called Emirates was actually the first to jump on enthusiastically the A3XX bandwagon. Air France soon followed with its own interest in 10 aircraft, likely because the A3XX program would have final assembly in Toulouse, home ground for the airline. On the 19th of December 2000, the A380 was officially launched with a name chosen for two reasons. With an 8 selected to represent the double-decked fuselage cross-section and 8 being a lucky number in some Asian countries. The numbers A350 had been used during the design process and A360 had also been considered, as well as the A370 being rejected because the number 7 being associated with a, another very large aircraft on the market. The development cost of the A380 had grown to 11 to 14 billion euros when the first aircraft prototype was finally completed, from the humble 4 to 6 billion euros that was considered at the start of the program. 
Airbus would convert its preliminary designs into launch versions, with the A3XX100 becoming the A380-800 and the A3XX-50 becoming the small A380-700. Then the A3XX-200, the larger version, would be the proposed-900 version and the freighter version giving the F designation. Remarking at the launch, Manfred Biskoff, the then chairman at Airbus said, that Airbus has a new flagship. This is a major breakthrough for Airbus as a full range competitor on world markets. We are convinced that this aircraft will have a bright and extremely successful future. Today in the year 2021, we can look back and see that the A380 was designed for the market of 1988, where the world was optimistic about its growth and it seemed that the hub-to-spoke travel would grow forever. Alas, Airbus with all of its might couldn't stop the train in time and switch tracks like Boeing to the new point-to-point -point model, and the A380 was built simply too late for the world. Thanks so much for watching my little video today. If you enjoyed this little extra video, then I suggest that you subscribe down below. It's free and you can unsubscribe at any time. And consider leaving me a like and a comment because that will really help with the algorithm. And if you want to support the channel more, then we have a fantastic Patreon where you can check out where we post videos early and ad free where possible. And you can chat to others and you can feel all warm and fuzzy because you're supporting me and the channel. So thank you again so much for watching today's video and I can't wait to see you on the next one.